De Canadese neuropsycholoog Dr. Michael A. Persinger stuitte bij onderzoek in de hersenen op een centrum voor religie. Een speciaal geconstrueerde helm zou door middel van prikkeling op deze plek een mystieke ervaring kunnen oproepen. Programmamaker Rob van Hattem speelde voor Proefkonijn in een aflevering van Noorderlicht getiteld De Reliquap. relatively normal human brain. You can see there are two sides, left and right, left temporal lobe here, parietal lobes here, uh, primarily involved with the sense of presence, an occipital. If we split the brain in half, we have the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere, and it's connected by this structure here called the corpus callosum, this massive tract system, and just in front of the splenium, the dorsal hippocampal commissure. Now that hippocampus is, you can't see here. We have to go to another brain, cut slightly differently. And in this instance, if we take this brain, left and right hemisphere, cut it horizontally, take the top off, and look now down inside, you can see this jelly roll-like structure. That's the hippocampus, electrically very sensitive, extraordinarily sensitive to weak magnetic fields. And there's the hippocampus here. And that's the part you can influence. And that's the part, one of the major parts that we influence. This is the gateway to memory. In front of it is the amygdala. If you stimulate them both in connection with the interactivity um, between the two hemispheres, you can bring on a mystical experience. Als ik niet slaap, ontvangen mijn hersenen een overvloed aan signalen van buiten mezelf. Ik weet dat het echte ervaringen zijn. Maar hoe weet ik dat zo zeker? Mijn zelfbewustzijn zegt dat het echt is. En dat is in essentie een conclusie van mijn hersenen. De vraag is alleen of die conclusie wel altijd juist is. Sinds mensenheugenis wordt in alle culturen melding gemaakt van mystieke of religieuze ervaringen. Ze komen niet uit de buitenwereld. En toch is iedereen die het heeft meegemaakt ervan overtuigd dat het gaat om echte ervaringen. De mystieke ervaring is een van de grootste raadsels van de geest. My ultimate goal is to understand the portions of the brain that mediate the sense of self. And that was the goal initially, to find the sense of self and to understand depression. And it was because of this research that we began to realize that we can generate the mystical experience. It was because of that thrust towards understanding the sense of self, that we suddenly begin to realize that the sense of a presence, the prototype to the God experience, was in the brain itself. So we didn't start to find God in the brain. We ended up finding God in the brain. De mystieke ervaring wordt veroorzaakt door een overactieve kwap in de rechter hersenhelft. Dat schreef de neuropsycholoog Michael A. Persinger in 1987. Nu in 1995 beweert hij dat hij mystieke ervaringen elektrisch kan oproepen. All experience is basically a kind of electromagnetic matrix, like a, a neural net, that by imitating and implanting patterns within that net, we can induce experiences. Because after all, this great rabble knot, when it works, when it's functional, when it's alive, is little more than a complex, chaotic electromagnetic pattern. De mystieke ervaring als elektrisch op te wekken hersenfenomeen. Hoe kan ik weten of dat waar is? Door een proefpersoon te interviewen? Nee, dat levert slechts geloof op. Mijn rationele zelf kan alleen overtuigd worden door zelf proefpersoon te zijn. You didn't get caught by the time change, did you? I think we are right in time. Oh no, but you realize the hour change, right? Yes. Okay, good. Meet right. you the lab then. Okay. This is actual the brain helmet. Yes, this is the Corin helmet. And what it is, is a ordinary motorcycle helmet within which are embedded solenoids, which generate magnetic fields 
through the temporal lobe and by using complex fields which imitate what neurons do, we can have very, very weak fields, very weak intensities, much less than that of a blow dryer or a hair dryer, produce experiences within the brain. We amplify that effect by stimulating the area towards the top of the brain which is involved with the pineal organ. So actually, what you say is, if you give me the helmet, put it on, give waves on the solenoids, I will have certain brain experiences. Depending upon the frequency, the pattern, the structures we access, you can generate different experiences by applying specific electromagnetic patterns. Okay, now all of these tests that we're going to be doing with you today um, all measure a very specific function of the brain, and we know that every, every area of the brain controls a function. So what we'll be able to do is work backwards and say, um, based on the performance on these tests, how those areas of your brain are functioning right now. Mm -hmm. Testing, one, two, three. What she's going to do is say, now repeat, and the word she says after that is the one I want you to say. Mm -hmm. Now repeat. Tent. This Church. Well, well, it's good. Okay, I'll get you to put those, that blindfold on. Okay. Make sure that it fits you comfortably, doesn't squish your ears or anything. Mm -hmm. That's okay. It's okay. Well, I'm going to get the board out, so I'll just get you to keep that on. Mm -hmm. Drie uur lang met psychologische tests doorgezegd. Een beetje psycholoog moet nu toch weten hoe het met mijn geest gesteld is. En of ik gevoelig ben voor mystieke ervaringen. The next part of what we have to do is personality based. It's all paper and pencil tests. What these do is measure uh, your beliefs. Belief in science and belief in God are not compatible. Once I start talking in enjoyable city, I have a hard time living. I believe that there is a God. Yes. Well, the, the sense of self is the feeling, the phenomenological experience of being an entity, of being something that exists but has identity. We know it must be tied to certain neural cognitive processes which in, are influenced by the way the brain is organized and by the person's personal history. So we're pursuing that, and in the process of pursuing this sense of self, we begin to realize that the sense of self is also capable of anticipating its own demise, of anticipating its own dissolution, death. And therefore, any process that minimizes the imminent fear and apprehension of that death will be reinforced. And what we find is that the God concept, the idea of something infinite, and hence no death, often emerges at about the same time that the sense of self emerges. And the experience of the sense of presence, the mystical experience, is a kind of emotional feeling that makes the individual feel that there is infinity, that there is another, that there is a cosmic presence. It is a, it's a kind of personal signature, a personal conviction that this has happened. And when you have these two together, the sense of presence and the requirement to have a feeling of immortality, then you've got the basic ingredients of a God phenomenon. So actually he's saying the self is impossible without the mystical experience. For the most part, I would say that the sense of self, the way cultures have developed, have entwined the God concept, whatever it may be, the idea of immortality, have entwined it so intimately from the time the child begins to emerge that it's very difficult to separate the two. It doesn't mean it can't be done that way, but you can think of the God concept, the God experience, as a kind of cognitive virus. Once you've introduced it, you can't get rid of it, because once you've been afraid and apprehensive about dying, and then you've been given a solution that you won't die because there's an infinity, and that infinity is called God, and you being a part of that, you won't die. Once you've got that cognitive virus operative, then your anxiety is reduced. And the more your anxiety is reduced, the more you believe in that particular thing that makes you feel less anxious. So once you have an anxious person, 
particular about the sense of self, and you've introduced this belief, and the anxiety's been reduced, the critical thing is the anxiety has to be reduced, then, of course, it's almost impossible to rid the cognitive matrix of that virus. Like, I'll listen for you. We don't wait out shoes. However, you're more comfortable. Like okay. that? Okay. I think I'm fine. Okay, have you had any EG before? Uh, EG recording, yes. Okay, so you're familiar with the equipment. The reason I'm using tape on these front ones is because the hair. I'm gonna put a headband on you, it's just gonna help keep the electrodes secure in place. Mm -hmm. Is that too tight? No, it's all right. It's, it's rather comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tape it on to your headbands. Okay, that feels secure? No, well, I hope they're still there. Well, uh, I'll do a check. What did you do to my brain? Um, in the experiment in which you were the subject, the primary subject. We first of all evaluated your potential. We've been looking at the kinds of tests that isolate a person's potential to have a mystical experience. We know that people who are writers, poets, musicians, uh, the general creative population are much more prone to mystical experiences in general. So we isolated that characteristic of you using neural psychological tests. On the basis of that, I knew how your brain was organized in terms of its neural functional characteristics. So then what we did is we first stimulated your right hemisphere to produce an increase in activity. That also produced an increase in your left hemisphere so you became more aware, a kind of induction process. Uh, the next stage after 30 minutes is that we then applied a bilateral field, equal intensity, simultaneously to increase the experience even more. Experience goes by the drunks. And then because you had volunteered, and this was the first experiment like this, we then decided to amplify your experiences because your profile indicated you would not be prone to mystical experiences. And so what we did is enhance your experiences even further by applying a magnetic field over the top, which would then depress certain uh, compounds, certain chemicals, which would increase the electrical activity and enhance your experience. It kribbelt under the helm. Ik kan er niet bij. Laat maar. Het verdwijnt vanzelf wel weer. Ik kom tot rust. De tijd is moeilijk te schatten. We've had many critiques uh, of our work, and many people are very aggressive about it. Some religions more than others. However, once they realize what we're doing, they're less threatened. What we're interested in is finding the portions of the brain that mediate the experience. We're not interested in disproving or proving. We're not interesting, interested in embarrassing people. We're not interested in demeaning anyone's belief systems. What we really want to know is the part of the brain that mediates the experience, because it has practical application. You see, more people on this planet have died and been killed in the name of gods, be they Allah, Jehovah, Buddha. More people have died for those kinds of beliefs. We want to know what generates these experiences within the brain because when people have these experiences, they often feel, depending upon the situation, that there's cosmic consent to kill other people. So we think it's very important from a human point of view, from a species point of view, to find the part of the brain that mediates this experience so we can help differentiate the kinds of religious experiences that can lead to mass wars. That's beautiful. Nice and trendy. Starting to drift. 
Opeens voel ik mijn rechterarm tintelen. Niet onplezierig. Mijn armspieren trekken met kleine schokjes aan mijn hand. Mijn schouders en nek schokken ook. Ik zie bewegende lijnen die in één punt verdwijnen. Gele lijnen met een purperen rand. Daaromheen een cirkel van gele puntjes. Het is heel subtiel en zo weg te denken. Maar als ik het toesta, is het er. Onmiskenbaar. One thing we've been impressed with, historically, cross-culturally, is that, well, 30, probably 40 percent of all people will have a depressive episode sometime in their life when they feel there's nothing, no meaning to life. And many of these individuals are so depressed they require treatment. But one thing that takes place, interestingly enough, is that they may have a religious or mystical experience, or in more modern context, a visitation experience from alien intelligence. And suddenly they feel whole again, integrated. And they can deal with their lives. They can love. They can be productive. They have a sense of purpose. But our argument is, if we can find that mechanism, that neural process that generates that, then we can bypass the religious belief. We can bypass the complications that come with it and go directly to the source and treat depression directly and help give people a sense of purpose about the dangers of the religious belief. So you say we are actually developing some kind of a treatment, a medical treatment against anxiety? Well, we want to deal with anxiety. Uh, there are lots of drugs that deal with anxiety. We're trying to get to that unique and complicated kind of depression that's tied to the sense of self. When you feel that you don't exist, that you won't exist, that you're going to die, that there's an ultimate dissolution of the self, when there's nothing left. That is totally incapacitating. And we want to find the positive aspects of a religious experience that can often reverse depression and do it experimentally without the religious overtones so people can be treated quickly and effectively. You can hear the beat. It's got a beat. That's the difference between one frequency and the other. And because the field's rotating, that's why you hear it speeding up right now. As it phases in and out. Nu begint ook mijn linkerarm te tintelen en te schokken. Mijn armen lijken te zweven. Opnieuw is het te onderdrukken. Ik laat de controle los. Geometrische patronen schieten voorbij als een eindeloze tunnel die om me heen raast. Alles begint nu te tintelen. Warme golven rollen door mijn lichaam van mijn hoofd naar mijn voeten. Ik voel me als een warme deken, deinend op het water. Your brain, oh, incidentally, your brain is pretty exciting in many respects. Your brain is one of the few brains that we've seen that shows entrainment. That is, large areas of your cortex were firing in synchrony with the applied field. And so your brain was sort of being, or I should say not your brain, but the neurocognitive, neuroelectrical activity was sort of being driven. And when we turned it off, it just sort of went into a state of where you just sort of let go. And you experienced that as suddenly falling asleep. And even your EEG shows that you, if we wouldn't have gone in and, and uh, opened the door, you probably would have been in pretty deep sleep. So did you give me a mystical experience? Well, that's up for you to decide. We certainly produce the components. We induce the components that in the average person would have generated a mystical experience. Usually it would have been more emotional. But in terms of the mystical experience, that's up for you to decide and for you to define it. Because that's how they're always defined, according to the context of the individual and the personal significance to the individual. But this was you who induced my experience. That is correct. We induced, or the equipment induced the experience because it basically imitated what the brain does normally. 
for me, it was a rather pleasant experience. Well, we're hopeful, we're happy. I mean, we, we, we tend to make sure that experiences are pleasant. We can use negative ones, but uh, people uh, uh, tend not to appreciate them. There's also, also ethical guidelines, so we tend to make them very positive. Doesn't it give a strange feeling that you're capable of manipulating people's brains? No, it's not a strange feeling. I think it uh, gives us validity to the principles of neuroscience that we understand how the brain operates. It also gives us a great sense of responsibility, scientific responsibility. And it's a thrill to be at the threshold for potentially solving one of the great enigmas of mankind, which is the sense of self. But on the other hand, you could argue, if you're capable of giving information by magnetic fields to the brain, I mean, where does it end? Well, discovery has a price. Civilization has a price. New inventions have a price. New ideas have a price. And that is, there are risks that take place and the way society, culture, civilization, prevents these risks from being detrimental is to make sure they stay within the public domain. And you're right, it's a risky technology. We may open up doors that will never be closed. But that's the uh, risk they will take as scientists, to understand the sense of the human self. But people will say, if you succeed in doing this, you're developing a mental atomic force. Oh, indeed. I mean, the possibility of uh, the equivalent to an atomic bomb, the level of the mind, at the level of neurocognitive processing, indeed, that's what uh, we may be doing. Of course, responsibility, and ultimately that's what we are as human beings, responsible creatures, at least one would hope. The responsibility would prevent us from utilizing it in inappropriate ways, but you are right, it is a potential weapon because we can induce experiences and produce memories that the person is not aware of having induced. And they're just as real as any other experience. And the sense of self has changed forever. How would the scientific community respond? Because I can imagine that people are somehow frightened as well. Yes. One of the, one of the questions that often emerges, what other scientists say? And I think it's really important for viewers to know and for human beings to know that scientists are human beings. Scientists, no matter how sophisticated they may appear, how bright they may be, are still human beings. They're still afraid to die. They still have a sense of self. And there are certain things in science, particularly of the religious nature, that science has stayed away from, almost by a kind of quiet consent to stay away from investigating religious phenomena. There's absolutely no reason that we should not investigate the religious experiences of the brain. There's absolutely no reason that we cannot take the brain and understand it in terms of how it would generate mystical experiences. The scientists stay away from it because scientists themselves are human. And I think that's the primary reason that science, I should say science behavior, which are the humans in science, have ignored the important, powerful consequences of the brain basis of mystical experiences. Do you believe in a God? Do I believe in a God? Yeah. I don't believe in anything. What I do, however, is I know that there are experiences that people have that make them say they believe in a God. I personally look at it from this point of view. Science is the pursuit of the unknown. I don't know if there's a God or not. What I have to deal with are the data. So if I have a camera and I take a picture of an apple, then I develop the film and there's an apple, I understand that. But if I have a camera, I take a picture of an empty space, and I develop a film, and there's an apple, even though there was no apple there, then that tells me there's something about the internal wiring of the camera that made the apple. I strongly suspect that the God experience is very similar. It's an intrinsic wiring of the human brain that's essential for the sense of self to be maintained and to become stable.